Good morning, everyone. Let's stand and sing together. Nothing can tear us from The grip of his mighty love. We've only glimpsed his vast affection, heard whispers of his heart and its passion. It's roaring down. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong. It is furious, love is sweet, and love is wild, and it's waking hard to life. The Father loves and sent His Son. The Son laid down His life for all. He lavishes his love upon us, so he calls us now, his sons and daughters, he's reaching out. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hard to lie. Let's sing that again. His love is deep, His love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, His love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, His love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. Oh, you're waking hearts to life. With your love. Sing this out, your love. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. Sing it out. Love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to lie. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. Love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. Oh, his love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, it is furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, and it's waking hearts to life. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good. It's good to see you all here. My name is Jeremy. I'm the worship pastor, and uh, we're just glad that you're worshiping with us. If you're new or new-ish, we're going to spend a little bit of time lifting our voice and our praise to the Lord this morning, so please join in. Uh, we're a small band, but that's okay. That means you guys sing loud, and we get to hear you, um, and it's really fun. So let's pray and sing together. Let 
It may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Sing that again. My God, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every war he wages, he will. And I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story is. I know how this story is. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. Let's sing that out. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good, and I'm gonna see a victory. See that? I'm gonna see.
Once I was blind, now I believe. You tore down the walls that kept us apart. What seemed like the end was only the start. Cause heaven's all around, heaven's all around, and Jesus is near. And I can see it now, I can see it now, your kingdom is here. Sing that again. And heaven's all around, heaven's all around, and Jesus is near. And I can see it now, I can see it now, your kingdom is here. you want to come and make the old things new come and move how you want to do it all that you can do come and move how you want to come and make the old brand new come and move how you want to do it all that you can do and heaven's all around heaven's all around Jesus is near, and I can see it now, I can see it now, your kingdom is here, heaven's all around. Come and move how you want to Do it all you can do and Come and move how you want to Come and make the old brand new Come and move how you want to Do it all you can do Praise the Lord Amen. You can be seated. We have some announcements for you this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Revision. We're so glad that you're here this morning. I'd love for everyone to take out your bulletin and fill out the connection card. This is something that we all do every week together as a way for us to stay connected with you. You can check a box to start serving in an area of the church or submit a prayer request so we can be praying for you throughout the week. We love connecting with you, whether you're here with us or watching online. So take a second to fill that out this morning. You can drop them in the offering bucket when it passes in a few minutes. We're starting a new series today on marriage, and we have a resource table in the back with books about all things regarding relationships. Today during the service, Mike will be pulling connection cards as a raffle to give away a handful of these books, so be extra sure to turn in your connection card today. I would like to ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare for offering. This is something we do as an act of worship to praise God and tell him we trust him with the blessings he's given us. If you're new with us today, please let the bucket pass you by and just drop in the connection card. 
As the ushers start passing the buckets, I want to talk about what's happening on April 30th. April is a five Sunday month, which means instead of having services that weekend, we'll be spreading out all over the metro and working with a variety of nonprofit groups. There's a QR code on your seat that you can scan and read about all the different services we have available for this month's Reach Des Moines. Be sure to look it over well because we have some really fun opportunities to serve that we haven't had in the past. It's going to be a great day and we can't wait for Reach Des Moines on April 30th. Would you please stand as we continue to sing together? There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Standing next to me, there was another in the water, holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the water. And I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I hold in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. No, I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the water holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding? What power set me free? There is a grave that holds no body. Power lives in me. Sing it out. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh. I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. And I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where sin. And I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison wall came in. Cause nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There'll be another in Standing next to me, there'll be another in the water, holding back the sea. And should I ever need to find how good you've been to me? I'll count the joy of every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I'll count the joy of every battle. That's where you'll be. Let's pray together. So God, we just count the joy in the battle. Just we, we know that you're there with us. Lord, we're still celebrating the fact that you are alive, 
that you've beaten death, that it has no sting, that it has no victory. And God, that we can stand firm on you. God, knowing that no matter what we walk through, what we go through in this life, you are there and you're fighting for us. Lord, we love you. So let me pray. Amen. Amen. You're going to take a seat. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors at Revision. I'm excited to be here this morning. How about you? All right. So you guys know, I like to be honest and vulnerable up here about my experiences as a fellow struggler along the spiritual journey. I want to kick things off this morning by doing that. A few months ago, my wife went on a trip with her sisters for a few days, and I discovered that behind my back for like the last 13-ish years, Jenny has been doing all the child care. And it's like, why not say something? You know, I tell her that stuff. If I put anything in the laundry room, she hears about it. Like, you may not have noticed because you didn't tell me good job yet, but I picked up those socks off the bedroom floor and I took them to the laundry room. I threw them right by the washing machine and everything. So, but what I found about marriage is that sometimes wives don't realize how helpful you actually are and it's, it's just, it's difficult. <laughs> but we've all heard, we've all heard this phrase, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. But the thing is, we live in the real world where first comes love and then comes baggage. It's true. We live in a society that sometimes romanticizes marriage. We watch all these fairy tales on screens that tell us that we can just find the one who will complete us and then have a lavish wedding. We'll get to live happily ever after. And we treat the altar like it's some sort of magical thing that whisks away all the baggage we brought up there. But not only is that untrue, I got terrible news for you. It's much worse. You actually walk away from the altar with about twice as much baggage as you brought to it because now you got yours and somebody else's, somebody you just made a vow that you're going to stick to even though they're broken and imperfect and messed up. And that's real. But there's good news. Marriage is difficult, but it's also beautiful, incredible, and life-giving, or at least it can be. We're kicking off a new series this morning called First Comes Love, Then Comes Baggage. And we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about love, dating, sex, marriage, conflict, divorce, singleness, and a whole lot more. Because my hope is that all of us will be able to get a bigger, better vision for marriage in a way that allows us to be better at being married now and in the future and be better at encouraging the married people in our lives or or both. I just want to strengthen marriages. I want to strengthen marriages because I have this belief that when marriages get stronger, everybody wins. Everybody wins. The people in the marriages win, but also the next generation wins and our friends win and our families win and our communities win and our church wins when marriages get stronger. And I realize everybody in here isn't married and I want you to know if that's you. The Bible says that's awesome. Sometimes our culture and our churches put marriage on a pedestal like it's normative and necessary, but God paints a bigger, better, more beautiful picture of singleness. Paul actually says at one point that if you're not married, you're doing better than the people who are married. Let's be real. Some married people just laughed because in their minds they thought, praise hands emoji, amen to that. (laughs) All right, so no matter where you're at this morning, every message in this series is for everybody because we're a community and we need to encourage one another and help each other step in to the futures and the plans God has for us. And this morning I want to kick things off by like, starting at the very beginning because Sound of Music taught me that's the very best place to start. And we're going to talk about attraction and dating because this is inescapably true. Who you date and how you date is going to have an effect on your marriage. Who you date and how you date is either going to add to the amount of baggage you bring into your marriage or reduce that baggage. And every marriage has baggage. Every marriage has got an imperfect person in it and also his wife, right? (laughs) The thing is, though, if we get this correct at the beginning, we do it the way God dreamed us up and designed us to do it. It's going to be easier 
and better for us moving forward because we'll be able to step into marriages with a whole lot less cracks and dents that need to be repaired. And that doesn't mean that brokenness can't be fixed and it doesn't mean that baggage can't be overcome, not at all. It just means that when you start from a healthy, safe space of love, you're able to spend more of your energy focused outwards on making a difference in the lives of the people around you and living into the fullness of your purpose. It's a whole lot easier way to do marriage. As we talk about dating and attraction, there are a whole bunch of books about it. We have a couple really great ones back at that resource table. I'd encourage you to pick them up. There's hundreds of great ideas about how to do this well, but this morning I want to boil it down to just three simple principles that we find in the first chapter of the erotic love poem that God slapped smack dab in the middle of the Bible. Song of Songs is a weird book, you guys. It's a poem about Solomon and his first wife and how they fell in love and got married and got it on and then got into a huge fight because that's the next step in marriage after a honeymoon. If you've ever read it, you probably found yourself at least once or twice wondering, why is this in the Bible? And to be fair, there are some people who think it's all allegorical, that it's simply like a, a word picture of God's love relationship with humanity, and so they would argue that like in chapter 7, when Solomon writes about his lover's breasts, that's an allegory for the Old Testament and the New Testament, because there's two of them. <laughs> Never mind the one is a thousand years older and three times as big. So. I mean, it's not all wrong, right? There's some allegory here. Marriage. The, the love relationship between a husband and wife is meant to be a picture, a, a small imperfect picture, but a picture of the level of intimacy God created us to experience with Him. But also Song of Songs is about human love. It's about how God created us with this unique wiring and unique ability to become one with another human being. And this is how it starts. Song of Songs, verse 1, Solomon's Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. You just jump straight into the deep end. Sex and alcohol in the first two verses. <laughs> but this is, they're starting with the wedding night, then flashing back to falling in love. It says, pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. And so she begins by saying, oh, I want him to kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. I made Jenny memorize that in four different translations. Just, you know, <laughs> hammer that home. And then she says, your name is like perfume poured out, which is kind of weird, right? But it's actually cool. See, 3,000 years ago, you might be surprised to learn, they did not have indoor plumbing. Baths were a little bit difficult to come by. It's facts. So what they did was they took this oil that had been through a long purification process that made it smell good, and they would rub it all over their bodies. Let me tell you, if just personal experience. If you have a middle school-aged boy living at your house, or if you've ever met a middle school boy in your whole life, you can probably picture how important it is to have stuff that covers up the smells that come from not bathing. It was really valuable and meaningful in their society. So she's like, your name is like perfume poured out. It's valuable. And when she's talking about his name here, she means his character. She's saying your character, your reputation, your integrity, they're pleasing, they're fragrant, they're valuable, they matter. No wonder everyone else is jealous of me. You're a guy worth loving, worth having, worth committing my entire life and future to because you're a man of character. I think this is profound, but it's also profoundly countercultural in our day and age. Because when we talk about attraction, like finding, finding the one we tend to make a mistake that's subtle but significant. We focus more on characteristics than we do on character. But here's the first simple idea for setting your marriage up well for success this morning. Character matters more than characteristics. Character matters more than characteristics. I mean, it's easy to fall into this trap of being asked about what you're looking for in Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright and start listing off the, these traits that you hope they have. He's got to be tall, not like freakishly tall, but taller than me. And he's got to be funny. I want him to make me laugh. But not like so funny he's never serious because ew. And then rich, just medium rich to super rich. Anywhere in there, it's going to be fine. <laughs> 
back when I was doing youth ministry, I visited a, a high school girls' small group one Wednesday night, and they were going over their non-negotiable lists. It turns out that these girls had gotten together and made lists of all the characteristics their husband needed to have. So I asked them, how many things are on those lists? And most of them were over 20. One of them was 36. 36 non-negotiable traits because encouragement is one of my greatest gifts as a pastor. I looked at those girls and I said, it's so amazing that you're being intentional about this and you have a clear idea of what you're looking for. And you're probably thinking, this guy only exists in your mind. And guess what? You're right. <laughs> Burn the lists. <laughs> Burn them. You're going to experience a lot less frustration and a lot less heartache if you get rid of these lists and you start from a completely different perspective. Now, to be fair to the girls, they were at least trying. If you'd visited a high school guy's small group and asked for their list, they would have been able to come up with one. Hot. So <laughs> that's even dumber. Okay, But it's easy to get caught up thinking about the, the characteristics that we want in a partner. And it's not a bad thing to notice. It's not a bad thing to notice how somebody looks or, or what they do for a living or how funny or fun or spontaneous they are. Those are fine things to notice. They may even be a great entry point into a relationship. They're just a bad foundation for a marriage. A couple weeks ago, I was trying to grab some tools off like a shelf in my garage and I couldn't quite reach them. So I pulled over the nearest Rubbermaid container and I stood on it. And just as I grabbed the bag, the lid collapsed and I fell in and twisted my ankle and I ended up in a container full of baseball gloves and soccer balls and me. Here's my question. Is that a bad container? No, it's a fine container. It's just a real bad ladder characteristics don't make a great foundation for a marriage. And so if, you, if your relationship is just built on traits, you're setting it up to struggle because that's not what it's meant to be built on. Why? Because characteristics change. Proverbs 31.30 says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I'm talking about women here, but I think it applies to men as well. Character lasts. Beauty and charm don't. I remember a little while ago when Betty White died, I read an article that described her as drop-dead gorgeous, which was a little surprising to me to be completely honest with you because she was a golden girl when I first got introduced to her. But it made me press pause and realize, oh, Betty White wasn't always 90. I'm not going to be in my 30s forever. <laughs> Looks fade. I wasn't even starting with Drop Dead Gorgeous, but at least when Jenny met me, I had hair and abs. And I'll tell you what, if those were the only things about me worth building a life with, that ship has sailed, baby. <laughs> it's gone and it ain't coming back. But the thing is, what we're doing together is real life. Like life, life. And if that's what you're doing, if you're doing actual life together, there's going to come a moment when you stand side by side and see a teenager making destructive decisions and you've got to figure out together how to guide them in love toward a better future. There's going to come a moment where you sit side by side in a hospital room and receive a diagnosis that brings you to your knees. I promise you, I promise promise you in those moments it will not matter at all how she looks in a bikini or how tall he is a trophy is not going to get you through the tragedies that are inevitable in this shattered world but a person of character who will stand beside you and fight for you is character matters more than characteristics who they are is infinitely more important than how they appear and married couples in the room, don't forget that. Don't get caught up in this culture's list of, of all the traits that your spouse should have and start focusing on the ones you don't and forget what made you decide to do life with them in the first place. And here are three like, simple ways to watch for whether somebody you're attracted to has character and integrity, whether they have a name like perfume poured out. Number one, watch how they treat people. Specifically people who have absolutely nothing to offer them in return. And number two, watch who they hang out with. 
On some level, none of us can escape the reality that your friends shape your future. And number three, watch how they chase Jesus. We are never stagnant in our relationship with Jesus. We are either moving toward Jesus or we're being pulled back away from him. And our relationships have a significant effect on that. And so if there's somebody out there you're attracted to who isn't chasing Jesus or helping you chase Jesus, there's not a lot of value in continuing to pursue dating that person. And I know that sounds really, really harsh, but it's true. I get asked as a pastor sometime, is it okay for me to date a non-Christian? And I used to have this really nuanced answer to that. I'd be like, well, but I've learned over the years that clarity is kindness. And the most clear, kind answer to that is, no, just don't do it. You're made for more. A name like Perfume Poured Out requires chasing Jesus and helping you chase him too. So don't settle for anything less than that. You are a son. You are a daughter of the king. You're created by the creator in his own image. You are worth too much to settle for anything less. And I promise you that if you make character and integrity and respectability the things you're looking for most, you will save yourself a whole lot of pain and heartache and frustration and brokenness in the end. And while you're looking for that, uh, while you're out seeking that, my next tip for setting yourself up well for success in marriage this morning is become that. Watch how you treat people. Watch who you're hanging out with. Watch how you're chasing Jesus. Make it a priority in your life so that when the person you're looking for comes around, you're the kind of person they're looking for. Be the person the person you're looking for is looking for. Be the person the person you're looking for is looking for. And if you're not, like if you look at your life and you see some gaps right now, work on closing those gaps so that you can become the person the person you're looking for is looking for. Because finding the person you want to do the rest of your life with, finding the right husband, the right wife, is a great pursuit. But becoming the man or the woman God dreamed you up, knit you together, and placed you on this planet to be is an even greater pursuit. It's the thing that matters most. In Matthew 6, Jesus tells us, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. And what he's not saying there is that like, if you just check off a box of like, following Jesus, God's going to give you all of your wildest dreams. You're going to have a mansion on a lake with a Ferrari and a horse and a supermodel spouse. Like, that's not it. What Jesus is saying is that if you make the main thing your main thing, God will so drastically transform your perspective that you will have peace in all situations because you know he always provides. And so focus on who you're becoming. It's great. Maybe one of the greatest experiences in this life to find somebody to love, but the most important thing you can do is step into the future and the dreams God has for you. Listen, if you decide that your characteristics matter more than your character, you're going to win. Like no matter what your story holds, no matter what twists and turns are up ahead, you're going to win when you make that decision. And so is everybody else around you. Your friends are going to win. Your community is going to win. The person who marries you eventually is going to win because they didn't settle for you even though you are so, so, so imperfect. In so many ways, some ways you don't even know until you get married, and then someone says them to you, and you're like, oh, I'm worse than I thought. That's just real. <laughs> I saw a meme the other day. I sent it to Jenny. It said, stop complaining about your husband's faults. If he was perfect, he probably would have had a better wife. <laughs> she did not appreciate it at all, <laughs> apparently. Who knows what women want? It's impossible. But my point is this. My point is this. We're all flawed. And we're always going to be flawed. But if we work on chasing Jesus with everything we've got, and we look for somebody else who's doing the same thing, we provide a strong foundation upon which a marriage can be built. Because we chase having a name like perfume poured out, like Solomon had. Right, and back to him and his beloved. She talks about why he's a man worth committing her life to and says, no wonder everyone loves you. They're right to adore you. And then verses 5 through 7 are really interesting. We see the intersection of two very real things in our lives that often work at cross purposes to one another. Insecurities and boundaries. She writes, dark am I yet lovely daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Cater. 
like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I had to neglect. A quick time out. Right here she's revealing her deepest insecurities. Like back then, wealthy, high society women stayed inside all day. They didn't do any outdoor work, and so they kept their skin as light as possible, and that was considered beautiful. Fast forward 3,000 years, we pay monthly fees for skin cancer. We are neat. But she's super insecure about the fact that, that her tan skin might be seen as not beautiful, that, that she has the appearance of someone who spent more time working out in the fields than working on the way she looks in a mirror. She's got insecurities. And so do you, and so do I, and so does everybody else who, le who ever lives. And one of the greatest dangers of insecurities when it comes to relationships is that they can cause us to compromise. Something in us isn't sure whether we deserve to be loved. Because we look at ourselves and we see something or some things that we don't like. And then we're liable to let our guard down or to take down some of the guardrails that we've put up in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, if we do that, this person will love us even though we are not sure we deserve it. But what's crazy in Song of Songs chapter 1 is that she doesn't do that. She knows who she is and who God created her to be. And so she just reveals this deep insecurity that she isn't beautiful and that he might not love her. But then she says, tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? What's she talking about? Well, back in the day, sometimes women would try to find a husband or at least make some money by hanging out next to the men in the fields and offering themselves to those men. And Solomon's beloved here says, that ain't me. I am not selling myself, and I'm not throwing myself at a man. I know who I am, and if you want me, you're going to have to respect my boundaries. And I love it so much. She meatloafs him and Beyonce's him all in the same sentence. I call it a meat Beyonce. Yeah. She says, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. So if you like it, you're going to have to put a ring on it. Oh, 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 oh. And it's amazing. And it's still applicable 3,000 years later. Because guess what? She walked into marriage and he also walked into marriage with a whole lot less hurt and a whole lot less pain and a whole lot more ability to build off of a strong foundation because she set boundaries that she respected. This is the third idea I've got for you this morning. Just a simple way to set yourself up for success. Build boundaries or you will build up baggage. You got to pick. One of them's coming with you. It's, it's inescapable. You're going to have boundaries or you're going to have baggage. And, and boundaries can sometimes help us avoid baggage. Not all of it. I mean, we bring a lot of baggage into our relationships. That comes from our, our jobs and our childhoods and a whole lot more. But some of the heaviest, grossest stuff we bring in tends to be things from previous relationships where we crossed boundaries we wouldn't want to have crossed. There is not one married person in the room right now, not one divorced person in the room right now, who if you gave them a time machine would not go back and do dating differently at least a little bit so we could bring less baggage into our marriages. There's not one. Because it matters to set good, solid boundaries. They protect our souls and they protect our hearts. Like so many of the do-overs we wish we could have in life have to do with boundaries we wish we wouldn't have crossed. So you got to build boundaries or you're going to build up baggage. And, and here's the deal. you got to do it ahead of time. Like now. Pre-decide. You cannot decide on the boundaries of your relationship as effectively after you start dating. You know why? You literally can't do it. Your brain is too dumb. Not yours specifically, like everybody's brain. There's been a whole bunch of research in the last 10 years about how your brain chemistry actually changes in the early stages of a relationship. Like when you start dating someone new, your brain is like, ooh, yeah, I'm in on this. It literally shuts down part of its own thinking apparatus. And it's not that you don't want to see clearly or think clearly. It's that you can't. Everything's coming up rosy. And you're like, oh, his work ethic. Mm. And your parents are going, he doesn't have a job. <laughs> he plays Fortnite all day. 
You know what your brain does? Your brain goes, yeah, but some of these streamers make a lot of money on YouTube. I just think if my man can practice 10 hours a day, stop it. Stop it. You got to decide on your boundaries before you get the rose-colored glasses to make it impossible for you to set them well. And there's three key areas where you need to set boundaries or your heart is going to take you to a place you weren't quite ready to go yet. Time, talk, and touch. Now, time seems like a weird one, but here's the deal. As soon as you start dating somebody, everything in you is going to see things rosy. And you're like, I want to spend every waking minute with this human being to the exclusion of all my other relationships. And it's fun, but it's also dumb. Here's why. A, there's a good to fair chance that the other relationships will last longer than the one with your new boo. Your parents are going nowhere, but your boyfriend might be. All right? And B, B, healthy relationships have to be lived out in community. We're built to do it. A good, solid relationship invites other people in rather than keeping them out. The second one is limiting your talk. It's easy when you're seeing things through rose-colored glasses to be like, I love you so much. You're perfect. You're, oh, show of hands. How many people in this room right now have heard a married woman call her husband perfect in the last six months? Anybody? Bueller? You got any guesses why? There are no perfect husbands. There's no perfect wives either. It's not a thing. Thing. And I'll be real, I know a few couples who eloped immediately and they're still going strong and it's completely nuts. But just be careful about having your mouth right checks. Your heart is not ready to cash yet. Take it slow and allow God to build a foundation. And then the last area is touch. This is an incredibly difficult boundary to set and keep in a relationship. But it's also the most painful, destructive boundary to cross in a relationship. This one will allow you to bring more baggage into your marriage than anything else. And as we talk about pre-deciding that boundary, let me throw something out to you. Asking the question, how far is too far, is the wrong question to start with. And we should know that because we don't ask it in any other arena of our lives. If I stood up here today and was like, I want to start beating my kids, how far do you guys think is too far? This is like verbally, or could I hit him with a, like a, a whiffle bat, as long as it doesn't leave a mark, or a mark, like how red, like how far do you guys think it's too far? Let me crowdsource that. You'd be horrified. I hope. You should be horrified with that, right? <laughs> like in this area, in every single area of our lives, we shouldn't be asking the question, how far away from God could I possibly get before I crossed over an imaginary line? We should be asking, how close to the heart of Jesus can I live? Because that's the best, most beautiful place to live. And when we start asking that question in relationships, how close to Jesus can I get, we're able to take off the rose-colored glasses and make wise decisions that protect us and protect the people we love and the one we're trying to do life with. And like, when it boils down to it, I just simple but clear countercultural advice, you guys, save sex for marriage. Save sex for marriage and save cohabitation for marriage too. Well, that's not stuff that our culture will ever tell us because we live in a society that tells us that, you know, sex and cohabitation are, are basically practicing for marriage and letting us know whether we're compatible. The problem is that every bit of data we've measured since the sexual revolution of the 1960s tells us that the exact opposite is true and not just kind of true, but like wildly, incontrovertibly true. Premarital, extramarital sex has ruined families, and marriages in the Western world. And we know it now. The numbers are in. No matter how desperately our society wants to just close its eyes and pretend that doing whatever you want is the best possible way, we know it now. And here's why. Sleeping together and living together before you're married is actually practicing for divorce, not marriage. Bear with me. Like physically, it's practicing for marriage. And everything from the outside looks like it makes sense to think like, hey, this will help us know like, how to be married to one another. But mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, it's practicing for divorce. Because marriage says, I'm all in no matter what. 
There is no asterisk. There is no exit plan. There is no way I'm leaving. I'm committing to you before I get everything I want out of this. I, I'm not getting all the things I want yet, but I'm all in anyways. Cohabitation and sex before marriage say, I'm giving myself to you for now, but I'm keeping the back door open. Just a, just a crack, but I'm keeping it open in case I don't get all that I want out of it and I'm not fulfilled anymore, or in case something that frankly seems better to me comes along. Like the reason it's destructive is that it gives us the mentality of divorce walking into a marriage. And so just set that boundary. Ironically, play in house hurts rather than helps your ability to one day figure out how to build one. Put up a boundary. And you'll bring less baggage into marriage when you get there. So I want to make it clear, uh, that doesn't mean at all that if you compromise that boundary or if you have compromised that boundary or if you're currently in that space, that your marriage is doomed to fail and you should just throw in the towel. It also doesn't mean that if you don't do that, your marriage is fail-safe and it's, it's going to be rock solid. That's just not true. It's not. I got plenty of examples on either side of that fence to suggest that it's not true. But it does mean that doing things by God's design allows you to walk into marriage with a stronger foundation that requires less work to fix and energizes you to be more outwardly focused and live into the fullness of God's purpose for your life. And so I want to encourage you to, to do that. But as I say that, I want to make two things really, really painfully, powerfully clear. I think sometimes in the church, at least in the tradition that I grew up in, we give off this idea that if you've messed up in this area, that if you have relational baggage, then you're like a permanent second-class Christian. You're, you're an outcast, scarlet-letter-deserving person whose story can't like fully be redeemed by Jesus. That's such a load of crap. The whole thing we're doing here is built upon the idea that Jesus redeems stories. That's what we celebrated last week. That Jesus can take any brokenness and heal it up. That that's what he's in the business of doing. That he saves sinners of whom I am the worst. We're all desperate for him. And he makes all things new. That's what he does. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're holding on to one ounce of shame or one ounce of guilt, please leave it at the foot of the cross and walk away from it. He died, he rose, we're forgiven and free. There's no reason every single one of us can't walk out of here free today. That's the whole thing we do here. That's who he is. And the second thing I think that sometimes is destructive is we, like, we turn this relationship thing that God gave us into a religion and we tell kids like, hey, if you check every box and you do it just right, God's going to owe you all of your dreams coming true. If you never make any mistakes, then God owes you a perfect marriage. Guess what? Nope on that one, too. <laughs> I have not found that to be my experience at all. And no one I know has either. Do you know why? Because you're a part of marriage and you're imperfect. So no marriage that includes you is ever going to be perfect. Perfect isn't happening this side of God setting all things right and making all things new. Because every marriage has two real people with real problems and real sin and real selfishness in it. But I promise you guys, doing it the way God designed it to be done is better and more beautiful. I'm convinced of that in every single area of my life. I've lived long enough to know that it's true. And I've lived long enough in, in this area to know that happily ever after doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because marriages include people, but happiness does happen. Joy, meaning, and purpose happen no matter who you are, what your story is, or how much baggage you bring. It just takes commitment and a whole lot of hard work. Finding the person that you want to live the rest of your life with is like an incredible gift. There's almost nothing better on, on this planet than finding somebody who looks at you and says, you are imperfect, but I love you. I love you, and I'm all in through thick and thin, so let's write this story together all the way 
to the end of it. But as you do that, like if you will remember that character matters more than characteristics, if you'll fight to be the person the person you're looking for is looking for, and if you'll build boundaries so that you don't build up baggage, you'll be set up well for the story God wants to hand you, no matter what it looks like and no matter who the one ends up being. Will you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for giving us the gift of love. Thank you for relationships. Just thank you for the opportunity to, to love and be loved unconditionally. Lord, all of us have baggage. All of us have mistakes and scars and dents in our story that need to be healed up. And all of us live in the middle of a society and a culture that will give us infinite bad advice for how to move forward and how to do this right. And I pray, Lord, that you just thunder in our souls. Remind us who you created us to be. Help us to make the main thing our main thing so that no matter what happens in life, no matter what our stories and futures hold, we win and everyone else around us wins because we're stepping into the life and the beauty that you dreamed us up and placed us here to live. I pray for our marriages. I pray for our future marriages that you would strengthen them. I pray for those of us who are hurting in our relationships right now, who aren't where we want to be, that you would strengthen us, that you would give us the peace of knowing that you always provide and that every single one of us would walk out here, not with guilt or with shame, but in the freedom of knowing that you love us, you created us in love and for love, and your love is beyond anything we can imagine. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Hallelujah. 
came the morning, lift your voice, that sealed the promise, your buried body, out of the take a seat just a couple last things we have a resource table at the back this entire series we're giving away things back there we have books they're like 15 or 20 bucks on amazon if you will actually read it take one if you want to give us 10 bucks for it that's awesome but if you'll actually read it go ahead and take it i want to give away some free books though today and just make some people take them and i'm going to do that by drawing connection cards out of this bucket and then Three weeks from now, two weeks from now is reaching one, but three weeks from now, I'm going to give away restaurant gift cards by drawing connection cards out of this bucket because I'm going to bribe all of you to start filling out connection cards every week. However, I got to do it. However much it costs me, that's how... That's how we're going to get this done. And next week, we're actually going to have a marriage devotional, like a two-week thing. It takes like 10 or 15 minutes a day to, to just dive into marriage and ask each other questions. It's awesome. So super excited about the resource table. Also, there's prayer over there in the corner if you need it after the service. But free books today go to Mike and Abby Skinner, Rochelle Smith, Bella Webb, Ellie Hamer, and last but certainly not least, Mallory Brunk. You guys get some free books, and remember, in a few weeks, gift cards. Fill out your connection cards. Have a great week, everybody. Love you. We'll see you next Sunday. Grab some popcorn on your way out.